This is the NeoBooks call on Monday, October 14, 2024. Um, we were just checking in a little bit. Uh, and what were you just talking about? No, he was asking me about the incubator. Ah. That it being actually located, it's, it's based in Toronto, but they very much had a Montreal local office because of the Montreal AI hub, Mila and all that. There's cool. this huge community here. Uh, Jack sent me a note saying she can't make today's call. She apologizes. Um, she's a regular though, and I'm thinking maybe we should move the calls later in the day because she's getting up at three or four in the morning to join these calls. Uh, and I don't know if, if later in the day is good for you guys. So it's worth inquiring if we move to like two o'clock in the afternoon Pacific. Is that I'd be able to do three uh, Pacific. Three, p uh, 3 p.m. Pacific. Is that too late for East Coast? The, the only thing is we have a call at 4 p.m. So it means a shorter call. Uh, yes, let's see. Uh, so we normally do the 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 free jury's brain call is from one to two Pacific, so that's uh, four oh sorry to five. three Pacific three, three. Pacific. Not, not well, three actually, Pacific. actually, so yeah, three, so two Pacific doesn't work for you, Jose, but three PM does. That would be six Eastern. Uh, two wouldn't be impossible. It's just that I've got another call that's back to back there, and so giving myself a, a little bit of room would be good. Um, gotcha. Maybe. I mean, if it had to be two, I, I'd do two, but you know, two thirty or three would be would be better. I'm back to back for three three hours. Yeah. yeah that's six, a lot. six PM is pushing it a bit for me, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so can we do before? Can can, can we do uh twelve Pacific? Or is that that's, that's interfering with lunch? No, that's really that wouldn't help Jax very much because yeah. two p uh, two PM Pacific is like eight or seven a.m. Uh, uh, Australia time. So it's 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 two p.m. Pacific is already pretty early for uh, for her. Actually, um, my 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 three hours in a row. Uh -huh. I'm counting neo books. So <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay then. Well, that would so move. if we move it from the back of the stack to the front of the stack, nothing changes. So if we did two p.m., it'd be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and what that would do was it would cause Free Jury's brain to end on time all the time, or whoever wanted to flow from Free Jury's brain into NeoBooks could do so. Yeah, but I'm I'm, yeah, thinking, doable. I'm thinking that's not a terrible idea. Um, uh, Klaus, does that work for you? If we if we were to move these standing calls to two p.m. Pacific, and you're in Bend, so normally that you that would be two p.m. for you. Yeah, that's fine. That would work. Yeah, the, the the only thing is I would appreciate if we kept them a bit tighter because, you know, ending at six and ending at six thirty, we're pushing it. You know, we could shift these calls to be one hour long and not ninety minutes long. I think that would not be unreasonable. So what? Why don't I make both change? I'll check with Jax to see if that works for her because that would be the reason for the change. Uh, but if it's if she gives a thumbs up, then I think. Uh, doing both things would actually be fine. And then we have F FJB next to NeoBooks, each is an hour, and we're good. Okay, um, that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Rick, sorry, you're. Uh, I'm not seeing your video, so and you're muted, so I don't know if that would work for you. But if we shifted these calls to 2 p.m. Pacific, does that work for you? Yeah, I can. Uh, I've got, I have to reschedule things, but with a note, yeah, I can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, good. Uh, then, um, Jerry, can I ask? Oh, sorry. Please, go ahead. F finish. Please. No, I was going to move to the next item of business. So go ahead. Uh, so my question is, uh, free Jerry's brain. How different is it from NeoBooks? So NeoBooks conceptually. Yeah, NeoBooks has been very pleasantly really focused on NeoBooks, whether it's about how to write a NeoBook or what is a nugget or the, our protocols, which are also very NeoBooky and all that. So I, I think NeoBooks, uh, maybe of the four calls that I host every week, is the one that's most on mission. Uh, free Jury's brain has not managed to free me from my brain. We did do some experiments early on, and we've we've crawled my brain and done some other sort of stuff. Uh, but I am I am still lodged in this proprietary software, uh, and it's become more of a salon over time. 
and uh, every now and then Wendy Elford will be on the call and we'll really go philosophical or, or whatever else. She's in, in uh, uh, Australia as well. Um, and then uh, the Fellowship of the Link, which meets on Wednesdays, is kind of more salonish as well, uh, except it has a different tone from Free Jerry's Brain. It's, it's uh, partly because some of the people there, the, one of the regulars is Aram Zucker Scharf, who works at uh, uh, the, Wall, the Washington Post in digital security, I think. And he's extremely geeky. Uh, Chris Ardrich is another regular on the Fellowship of the Link. And he uh, knows all about the history of commonplace books. He collects uh, manual typewriters. Uh, so so th th there's, th there's kind of that, you know, that aspect to, to those. And then uh, the OGM weekly call on Thursdays, I think has found a nice rhythm uh, for check-ins and content and is, is now on content about governance, which is working pretty well, but is different uh, in nature from NeoBooks and FJB. <clears throat> but I think the FJB call um it's pretty different from neobooks okay <clears throat> and and mark antoine you've been on both uh, i don't know if you want to yeah no uh, you're absolutely right and, and actually it is something i've been wondering about as you said it started with a very clear mission and it became very much more salon like uh sometimes to be honest i've been bending it to my agenda uh, <laughs> which is fine <laughs> which because is fine. Your, your agenda is very ogm -y or you know yeah, exactly. It's 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 and and I'm beginning to think: should we make it more congruent with what's happening? Because there's one aspect which was very much the uh, underlying data format of uh, knowledge appliances. Let's put it this way, and there was the the concrete problem of extracting data from your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, which we sometimes come back to, but but what mm -hmm. we've been doing otherwise is what does uh, data format for knowledge appliance it, it, from a data format level? Uh, what does that look like? And sometimes it grows indeed very philosophical, and, and and so it would be sad to lose totally that crowd. I do appreciate the the more philosophical times with Wendy, but mm -hmm. it's also true that I did appreciate the very focused beginning of this when we were actually doing things and maybe it would be nice to refocus on let's build shit <laughs> i think that's a that's a good idea also the brain 14 the latest version does include gen ai just not in forms that i particularly want it to but it has it has two different things that that in fact are melded with uh um with a, a chat gpt and there's now an API, which Pete and I have tried to use, but we got stalled. So we could get past the stall probably. And I think there's interesting things there. So I, I don't know, there's probably progress to be made in FJB that, that we, uh, a call where we sit down and look at ourselves and think, how can we refocus ourselves would be really useful. Um, so I think maybe this afternoon we can ask that question and see what's up. Uh, any other questions or thoughts about that? I was oh, it's just uh, you know when I hear it, knowing nothing about it, right. I hear that freeing Jerry's brain is in essence moving some of the data that might be nuggets out of Jerry's brain into nuggets. That's what I hear. Sort of, um, and I should also add that um, one of the other kind of clients of Free Jerry's Brain and regulars is Mark Trexler, uh, who is the founder of Climate Web. He is a brain user for a long, long time. He has actually been publishing brains commercially for years, for maybe 15 years. I don't know how long when he started Climate Web. Um, and Pete Kaminsky has written some code for him very pragmatically. Uh, one, of the, one of the puzzling things about the brain is that some brain users and some brain, even like Harlan on occasion, get freaked out by the brain's plex format and the, the, the funny look of it. And so they wind up trying to make it look more normal. And um, I'm like, no, 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 the Plex is actually part of the magic of the brain. It, it, and at one point, um, Harlan was gonna redo the brain to look more like Pinterest-ish, sort of. And I was like, you've just eviscerated what the brain is actually magical for. And so he, he, he actually gave it an alternate look, but also kept the, the Plex look. So, um, but Mark has, 
a lot more knowledge of technically of the brain, of how to use it. He's done many more things than I have. I don't use many advanced features in it. He does. He publishes multiple brains. His brains are almost exhaustive on the topic of climate change research and effects and a bunch of other stuff like that. Uh, highly, highly structured brains. Uh, and he's changed his business model several times to the point where his brain files tend to be open and available. And he then charges people for speedy access, which means if you're going to download the data to your desktop brain, which makes it faster and better, then he wants to get paid. But if, you're, if you want to go access the web brain, then, you know, glory be to you kind of thing. So I think that's an accurate representation of a piece of his business model. And, and then uh, there's another guy named Rich uh, Burden, and I've forgotten whether he came in. I don't think he came to the Neobooks call, or did he? I forget. He basically came in and presented, I think, to Free Jerry's Brain and uh, did a demo of his platform called Composer, built on top of an operating system called DXOS, the Distributed Operating System. And he has um, the equivalent of a Google suite, the Google Workplace suite, uh, written and running on a distributed base and you can sort of pick which distributed engine you want to run under the hood um, with a, an architecture that allows for frames uh, from a, so it turns out Rich was the CTO of the brain very early on, like 1990 or something like that for a year and then left. And I don't know much about what happened or, or whatever, but Rich has always wanted, his dream has been for there to be like this brain kind of resource out in the world, blah, blah, blah. So, so he's, he went and did a bunch of other startups. He's technically very proficient. The platform really works. I've used it. Uh, you could get a demo. Uh, it's actually quite elegant. Uh, but nobody's using it yet. And he's just recently in the last month or two kind of opened it up and gone public. And there's a couple of posts like, hey, we're launching this thing called DXOS and, and whatever else. But it's it's easy for me to imagine there being brain frame plugins on top of his platform that would that I could migrate to, perhaps. I don't know. Um, and that's What's his in, name again, Jerry? Uh, Rich Burden. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and I will put some links to, to his, his platform and stuff like that in the chat as well. Uh, and then what you were saying a moment ago about the moving of nuggets in and out. Right now, when I write a nugget, I write it in Obsidian and I push it to GitHub. And then I take that link and I put that in my brain. I would rather be writing the whole thing in the brain's editor, <clears throat> which I wish were Obsidian. Wouldn't it be cool if instead of the custom notes editor, Obsidian were actually the editor that worked natively with the brain. And then when I saved something, the file was just normally saved there. But right now I have to do this big runaround. So in some sense, my brain right now isn't holding nuggets as much as pointing to them because I'm writing them elsewhere and then I'm adding the links back to the brain. So it's not like the brains would be coming out of, the nuggets would be coming out of my brain and, and out into the world. It's like it would be actually more convenient if these things work together better because I have a lot of runaround that I need to do to make it all kind of look modestly seamless, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of explanation, but there, there's a lot of funny, different, interesting twists of plot and backstory. There's a lot of possibilities that that we've kind of stalled on. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's very funny because both Rich Burden and Harlan Hugh, the founder of The Brain, are on their own missions. They're very quirky. They 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 have strong feelings about what to do. Um, Harlan is in this very funny position that, in my experience, if you ask three brain expert users what they want next from the brain, you'll get twelve suggestions with no overlaps. Like 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 brain users want very different things, and they want them a lot. And I, if if Harlan is in the un, unenviable position of trying to serve, you know, people who have very different use cases or mental models for how the brain works for them. Uh, and as a result, he's added a lot of features over time, 80% of which I don't use. There's a full on calendar in the brain. There's a bunch of I, I have never touched, don't want to touch, don't know how to use, et cetera, et cetera. There's metadata in the brain that would be really useful if it were more available, more accessible to me, but I don't use the metadata because it adds work to input. Um, and for me, the speed of input really matters. But I'm backtracking a little bit. 
Um, and then the next topic I was going to raise for us to talk about was the our protocols work that you and I did, Jose, and just to brief everybody else on it and uh, show it a little bit. I was about to uh, paste it into my new how page on my website and just uh, start that, but then our internet went out and then this call came up. So I, I haven't done that yet, but I can eat that's a that's a quickie. Uh, so I could do that and we could go look at a how page. Uh, but the we uh, just so you know, we we've decided to go down um, a uh, web component as the way to extract from uh, from the platform, uh -huh. uh, rather than iframes. So uh, so we'll be able to have some web components for every single, just basically every protocol has a web component, and so you choose, you just go to it. You don't have to register it or anything like that you just go to its web component grab the code pop it into your div and you're done cool and actually i don't know what that means if for i'm using duda.co as my site builder and i know i know how to embed an iframe i know how to do like the, the, the html there but i don't know how technically to... it's pretty much the same except okay. that instead of embedding an iframe which is an, a call to an external page you're embedding both a script and then that script defines a, a uh, component that you can then uh, embed in your uh, thing. So in the component, you're defining whatever variables or attributes are available on that component. Yep. You can say, I want these colors, I want these things, whatever choices you wanna make. Uh, but because it's a component, it's actually happening live on your end yep. that it's calling the code, calling the, the stuff. Yes. So it's faster. It also uh, allows you to then say, here's, I don't have an iframe that I have to predefine that it has to fit into. Right. So you can then fix that div to, to accommodate whatever. And it's um, basically over on the component side, it needs to be flexible enough to deal with the environment that it finds on your end. Sounds great. And is that coming soon or is that actually working? It, that's no, it's coming soon. Well, okay. it's coming soonish. Uh, okay. But at least we've kind of decided where what path we're going, and so that will make well, us uh, make it easy for us to uh, to to sort of dedicate to one thing rather than a whole bunch of different solutions. Cool. Have you chosen a web component library? No. Okay. No, okay. no. But it's just that sort of like okay, we know what we're going to do. Yeah, um, and it's not I, 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 what we I, thought we were going to do. I'm I'm a strong web component fan. I read a fascinating article a few days ago speaking about web components versus other stuff in a very intelligent way. I'll try to find it and send it your way. If you way. do, please do. Yeah. Uh, it's it was it was quite brilliant. I'll I'll, I'll find it easily. It was from Baldur's. Yeah, we think it's the future of of what's good. What needs to happen? It's basically what needs to happen is we need to turn. Web components into to nuggets. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. The, the, and, and what are Technical you using nuggets. for the backend? Say that again, please. What are you using for backend? Right now, we're doing everything on Node. Okay, but storage? Uh, AWS. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Short term. Okay. Not okay. Articles in the uh, was easy to find. It's in the chat. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a uh -huh. big fan of Bjarne Sun's perspective in a lot of these things. Um, and Jose, do you want to do a demo of what we did? Do you want to kind of show where we got to? Um, yeah, I can do that. Just let me. I think that'd be really helpful for people to see because I we basically use the R protocol site. And I went through and created, uh, Jose coached me through creating a new R protocol, which required creating a new need, a thing I didn't expect or know, but I now understand. Um, and, and I think it'll make a lot of sense to everybody if we just see it on screen. Let me, yep. In the meantime, I can go back to Duda and, uh, oh, my connection was interrupted. Yes, I know. There it comes back. Good. So, 
So um, yeah, let me share screen here. You guys see that? Yes. So this is very, very, very early beta. Um, but we're, and actually walking you through it, Jerry, uh, last week, um, I took, I don't know, 10, 10, 20 items <laughs> of, of like, just, you know, when you, when you're talking to someone who sort of gets it, but doesn't get it because they're not familiar with what we're thinking. Yep. Um, it really helps. And so that was, that was great. I appreciate that. Super, super. It was um, fun. So what we have just, so, uh, go back to this. Our protocols, the idea is that they belong to us. They're open protocols. Um, that these protocols are designed for people to contribute to. We use needs as the, the starting point of where a protocol uh, sits. It's to answer a need. And so you can have multiple protocols that answer the same need. And you can have multiple versions of a protocol. So, you know, it's conceptually, it's the same answer, but it's a variant of that same answer. Uh, and you can have any number of those and you can have any number of answers. And the intent is that those then become adopted by people and they publish them. And that's uh, uh, what Jerry did was create one, create a need, create a protocol. And uh, now he's manually extracting that protocol onto his how page. And the how page, uh, thanks to Jerry, is, is a, a page about how to deal with me or how to interact with me or how to uh, do something with me, whatever that could be. Um, and so what we have is uh, our protocol studio. Uh, the way we start, and it's right now, again, it's not very um, smooth, is um, we start with life as life needs as the fundamental uh, question. So this, we're starting this, is the, this is the foundational or need in the right. system. Uh, and we break those down into a, a series of a dozen or so secondary needs. Those secondary needs are, you know, how to, cultivate friends. And so friends, community, safety and security, personal growth, leisure time, learning, uh, family, home, uh, health, wellness, work, uh, partnership, uh, and so on. And so those are sort of secondary. They're not the only ones anybody can create. Anybody can edit those uh, definitions and so forth. But essentially once it has a theme, what we want to do, and it's not really clear how we're doing it yet. What we want to do is lock in the framing. So you were talking about this, Marc Antoine, about how do we frame things. So we want to lock in the frame for a specific uh, need and the, a specific protocol. So what frames this protocol? What frames this need? So that if you change the title, if you change the description, you're still stuck to the frame. And so the framing is what uh, holds the integrity of um, relationship. If and I edit the framing, what happens? You can't edit the framing. Not even to correct the typo? You, well, no, you can, you can improve it, but you can't change it to something different. Right. No, I, I'm struggling with these things, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, that's that's where these struggles are, right? Yes. Um, so as part of um, this process of understanding how we communicate and so on and so forth, in community, there's a how to best to communicate with me. And we created that, Jerry created that. And 
Inside of that is a protocol. And that protocol is specifically, I prefer email over phone calls, texts, and other forms of communication. That's Jerry's protocol. And, 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 and if you liked it, you could adopt it and not have to write your own. Or exactly. if, you have, if you have different preferences, you could fork this and tweak it. See, it says fork. You could fork it, tweak it, and save it as your own protocol. Uh, or you could shop among the other protocols that meet the same need and maybe like someone else's much better and adopt and adopt theirs. Right. And and so this at, at the level this this protocol only exists once. It doesn't have multiple versions of itself. If it did, they would be present here. Um, and it there's only one protocol under this this specific need. There is there are no other protocols underneath. And so you would be able to then um, either create or fork, as Jerry described, or you could adopt them. And so if you adopt this protocol, uh, which you can't do in this version, but in our development version, we can. Um, the, the live version doesn't allow for it that yet. So you adopt it. Basically, it becomes part of your list of protocols um, that you could publicly say, this is what I've adopted. Um, but once you adopt it, then you can extract it and put it where you need it uh, in the real world and uh, websites and so on and so forth. And that's kind of what we were just talking about web components. And just to add a little bit of NeoBookie layer to this, uh, the way I see this, I'm going to write up my our protocol on my website as a NeoBook nugget that I will post um, in parallel to Massive Wiki the way I do all the other nuggets, except I'm going to copy the contents of that nugget into my web page, which is where it'll practically live for the outside world. Um, but but I I see protocols as a specific form or sub form of nuggets that have a particular metadata or framing around them and that are that live as partners or symbiotes with the R protocols project because that's what they're examples of and um, and so that dictates what metadata uh, that kind of nugget would have and how it works in the world blah 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 but it, but it, it seems to me to be like a specific kind of nugget which makes me really happy because it, that forms a very nice bridge between our project worlds. Um, Rick, please. Yeah, Jose, you probably already thought about this, but I'm just wondering whether you have or are, are thinking of developing a protocol for developing nuggets. <laughs> a protocol for developing protocols, a protocol for developing nuggets. Yeah. Uh, right. A protocol, essentially the idea here is that anything we run into of how do we do this, yeah. whatever the this is, yeah. it's meeting a need. So let's define the need. Let's be explicit about the need. Because a lot of the confusion is, what need are you actually meeting? Mm. Right? Let's be explicit about the need. Let's frame it. Let's then frame the protocols within that need frame. And then let's uh, build on that as far as variety because I will, I have a better solution than you do. Yeah. I know it. And so that's the protocol I want, not yours. And that's okay, but maybe I'm the only one that uses that protocol and nobody else in the world wants it. <laughs> and yours, everybody thinks is the best solution and then they start adopting yours. And that that's okay too, because hopefully what that means is we've answered a lot of how-to questions rather than letting people sort of figure that out on their own. And I'm assuming yeah. that at some point the interface might even include, here are protocols that have been most adopted or a sort by the number of adopters so that you could, when you come into a need, you could see, oh, here are the most popular ones. I should look at those first. And exactly. it, that will give you an order in which to sort of cruise through shopping for a protocol you'd like to adopt or for right. And we want to put a, a, a an AI front end on this to allow you to do that as well. Super. To, to help you with that. Yeah. All right, yeah, Rick, just, just, Rick, are you done? Go ahead. No, quite. No, I was just going to say differentiating. You say how to, there's what to and why. And there can be different elements to tracks to it and how do they interact. Because a lot of it, a lot of stuff focused on content creation. And, uh, you know, 
that's good for basic knowledge, but it doesn't mean to say we do it or how to do it and why to do it. So I just yeah, you know, I see I see Neo books, the yeah. nuggets about the why and the what, whereas mm -hmm. protocols is the nuggets about the how. And does a pro so like in in a pattern language you would have a because this is a situation in the world, there is this need that arises, and therefore we recommend doing this. That's a standard frame for pattern language, for patterns. Uh, this feels very patterny, um, and it feels like some of what we wrote included the why, um, although not a lot. No, and, and I think okay. that the need could ultimately point to the whys and the whats. Cool, okay. That makes right. that makes sense, and you're but you're trying to steer clear of that and let that live somewhere outside as editorial or as nuggets or as whatever it wants to be. I, I think there's going to be some fundamental why and what nuggets that that should live somewhere. Yeah, um, and that they need to live in a place of people who are writing books, people who are thinking, people who are, you know, doing that work of generating these ideas. But those ideas are distinct from the operational ideas of the how. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Just a quick reaction to the how. I, I, I think there's some overlap. I think you can have micro how-tos, which are nuggets, but also how-to of protocol. So the distinction you, you, just, you alluded to, I see overlap between the two. I'm not sure I get the distinction yeah. you're, you're pointing to. Well, you were talking about protocols being the how-to, right? Okay. Uh, that could be a series of nuggets, so to speak. It could uh, be a series that, of protocols that point to each other, too. They so could the, yeah. Yes. Yeah. These are but nested. The protocols don't exist only on one layer. So you could have a, a protocol that yeah. has 10 protocols in it, and each one of those could yeah. have 10 protocols in it. Yep. Yeah. But all I'm saying is if, there's, if, if somebody just wants a simple how-to do something or whatever it is, uh, they don't need to know the whole protocol. So I'm saying the protocols can be broken down into micro nuggets or smaller pieces. There might also be different ways that a protocol faces the world in the sense of you don't need to see the the, the whole detail of everything. You could just see the sentence, hey, send me, send me email first. Or yeah. a chat bot could know from the protocol what my preference is and just say it to somebody who's who's trying to get in touch with me. So how it manifests out to people could be very, very simple. Very quick. granular. Absolutely. Very granular. Exactly. And the idea um, is, is uh, Rick, that how it gets used in the real world mm. is to keep it simple, keep it dumb, keep it basic. But to be able to say, what exactly is this protocol do? Why is it? And, and you know, dig deep. Dig deep, dig deep, dig deep, and you can mm -hmm. go up into more complex protocols or broader protocols, I should say, not complex, but broader, and into the whys and into the, you know, the what's at a deeper and deeper level, but that everything has a relationship. That's the key. It's that they're not that they're independently standing out in the middle of nowhere in, in some website just saying, this is what I, this is how you do it. And then, but what does it relate to? We don't know what it relates to. <laughs> Two quick things before going to Marc Antoine. Um, I learned a lot from the way Jose coached me through doing this and the things that we moved around and, and how it evolved over time just for this one simple protocol. And also, I can easily see um, a, a chatbot leading me through that process. So it'd be like, oh, okay, you could you could train up a, a, a chatbot to be the, the, the protocol creator chatbot. And it could very happily like make make better yeah. make better protocols. That's the next step. And and in fact, say, oh, by the way, there's already a few protocols that smell like this or look like this. You know, do you want to borrow from whatever, whatever that? But that's yeah. that's a very easy path to see. Um, Mark Antoine, thanks for your patience. Go ahead. Um, let's find my concerns for a bit orthogonal. Uh, when Jerry, you said, oh, I could take the protocol and put it on my web page, then it. Is it, what do you see as the canonical living place of nuggets, right? How do you say, oh, it's federated. That means there's a, there's a, the version I put on my web page. And by the way, it's canonical resting places there because if there's evolution, it will happen there on the R protocol site. 
or or it may evolve on my side, but then what's the relationship between the evolution on my side and the one on our protocol side and so on and so forth? The federation question, is that something you've thought about? Um, I, 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 go, go ahead. I have, and you probably have too, so go ahead. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so so the, the idea is that this lives, what we want to do is have these live as JSON objects. Currently, they live as JSON objects in a database. We're working on putting them in an open uh, file sharing system. I, I don't know if you're familiar with IPFS. Yes. So the intent is to publish them to IPFS with their own um, ID. Not what about I, what about IPLD actually? Well, the same thing. Yeah, IPFS through IPLD. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, and they're not the same thing, but yes. Good. Well, uh, I mean, it, IPLD. Yes, it's more specific. It's different. Yeah. It, it has benefits. Yeah. Uh, okay, but that leaves the question of indexing out. I mean, you already said that search was not convenient. And IPLD doesn't solve the search problem. Right. So we need to solve the search problem independent of IPLD, which is what why we're developing it here first to solve some of those problems. And we want yeah. to do it on the edge as much as possible um, and rather than centralized. And so that's kind of what we're trying to figure out. How do we solve that problem on the edge as much as, po as possible? Okay. With AI especially. Yeah. And my answer to your question, Mark Antoine, is I'm I'm close to finishing a post that I hope to send to Pete for the this the next biweekly plex about how I cross post and forget about our protocols for a second. But um, I we we talked a little bit here in an FJB and about pose posse and and all you know all the different kind of what where is your canonical version? And for me, I think at this point I've landed on. Uh, uh, Markdown on GitHub is my canonical version. I happen to use Obsidian to edit those, but it could be any Markdown editor. Uh, yep. but, but that's kind of the starting point for me. Then I publish that as a web page, copy that, and then I will uh, paste that into uh, Substack and send it. And then the Substack will have one line that says the original or post lives over here and will point back to uh, Massive Wiki, right? But the Massive Wiki page will be much uglier, much simpler but much more open and available, right? Uh, and then I'll, I'll cross post probably to a couple other platforms like Medium and LinkedIn. That's my current plan. And my post describes that. And then it, suddenly I realized I, there's a lot more explanation I need to do and trade-offs and some other things to think about. So that's the, the part that I'm still writing. Um, now, if, if the post, if the nugget were in our protocol, uh, then very, so for any special purpose nugget, the or nugget would very likely live in that community, as you just said, Marc Antoine. So I would think that the R protocol as manifest on the R protocol project site, database slash distributed, whatever, would be the, the actual canonical one. I would be keeping a copy over on Massive Wiki and then doing whatever, whatever, whatever from there. But I would think that for anything that has the possibility of evolving in community, um, that that object, the one that's in community, needs to be the canonical one. And I hadn't thought about that till you asked the question, but that makes a lot of sense. And so there might be other kinds of nuggets that have similar relationships with other communities where the, the, the canonical one is outside in that community, and that'd be fine. If it was an NFT token, for example, uh, probably the, you know, the, the market where the NFT lived would be the canonical version. Right. But what you want, and, and this is one of the key problems that hyperknowledge is trying to solve is on the one hand, you want to point to this is the version I used. Yes. And, and, the, on ver the, one, and the versioning really matters. And versioning really matters. And be able to point somehow to the further evolution and forking history of that thing. And to say, well, at some point I may adopt one of those branches as the next, the next version and so on. And this is why on the one hand, IPFS or IPLD is brilliant because the versions are immutable. So you can point to the exact thing. It's not that good at back riffs, which means that knowing about further evolution is an open problem. Ah. And this is why I'm not fully satisfied with IPLD as the end all and be all of that thing. And, and for me, this is what hyperknowledge is about. It's, it's this notion that well, it's one of the main, many things it's about, but it, it is a key thing. Like you have these evolving schemas 
and uh, evolving concepts and evolving whatever. And there's the version I'm using now, and yet it's part of a forking path of concept evolution that you want to be able to accommodate speak to the future history. Yeah. Um, so that's something I've thought about a lot. I'm, I'm not saying I've cracked it, mm. but I, I think I'm quite close actually. It's, the, it's uh, thorny. But I'm also less religious about edge than you are maybe uh, in, in the sense that I'm okay with distributed server mesh as opposed to purely pure, like maximum distribution as an IPFS, purely peer to peer. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not, I love uh, pure peer to peer, but I've decided that it's more energy than I want to spend. I'm solving another end of the problem and mesh is good enough for me. <laughs> um, while you're still sharing screen, are there other things you wanted to show Jose or are there things that anybody else on the call would like to see from our protocols project? I feel like we spent quite a bit of time on it already for myself. And uh, I, I, I think both Rick and Klaus are probably by chomping at the bit to talk about uh, NeoBooks. Um, so I, I feel okay with this. I think there are future uh, things that we're working on that would be, uh, again, good to explore from a Nuggets perspective, right? Um, um, and, and how these Nuggets work and maybe how that will influence other Nuggets. Um, but but uh, yeah, I think for now I'm okay unless there's other questions. Questions, anybody? I think we're done. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Uh, and also, it was it was fun to do. I, I I appreciate that a lot. And now I can sort of think, oh, okay, here's how I would go about doing it. I now have to start a brutally simple version of it on my website, and then write about that and point to it. And then we can evolve that and say, oh, you know, and, and whenever you have web components, that will change how I post to my website. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that can still come. But I I like this as a start very much. Mm -hmm. Um, does everybody understand what the how page is or where it comes from? I think that not everybody was on the call when we thought about that. So uh, if, if you if you get any email from me at the bottom, it says slash now, and that is my SIG. Uh, I'm, I'm really tired of people with very long signature files. Um, I think they, they're too complicated. They're too much payload. Why bother? So this guy named uh, Derek Sivers, who the, he's the guy who did the, the video of Dancing Guy on the hillside and followership. Uh, that's a hugely watched uh, TED, TED uh, video. So that same guy was the founder of CD Baby back in the day, where he made a little bit of money. And now he leads a very quirky nomadic life. But he gives a lot of advice. And one of the things he came up with was these slash now pages. So he says, just make your signature a now page, but then keep that now page updated with how to get in touch with you, where you, you know, what your projects are, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm I'm medium on whether I keep my now page properly updated, but it's a very nice idea because it gives you a lot more real estate. Anybody who wants to can go there. You can put lots of links there and not annoy anybody because they showed up there on purpose and they really want to know, you know, what what are you up to now? And then in conversation with Jose, I realized, oh my gosh, the R protocols thing lends itself beautifully to being a how page. So my signature, once I'm done with the, the, the page on my website, I'm going to update my sig to be slash now slash how, and then write a post explaining the difference and what the upgrade means and so forth. Hmm. Why how now instead of just how? Um, cause how seems different from now to me and it's uh, kind of cute and yeah. elegant and maybe in the future that'll change, but I, I kind of like the, I like the, the, the rhythm of it. I like the, the echo. Okay. And, and it seems to me like, what are you working on and how do I deal with you or two, and how do you do what you do are two different things. Yeah. Th this is why I'm wondering why you want to attend rather than have them separate. Oh, how do you mean? No, I, I don't, I'm not going to do how now I'm going to do slash now and then separately slash how. Ah, good. I heard something else. Sorry. I and heard you'd have slash now slash how as like slash slash. Not at all. Good. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Cool. Uh, are we done with this subject? 
If so, Rick, Klaus, what do you guys want to talk about? Clara, she can go first. Well, I'm I'm uh, um, in conversation with a group of uh, of uh, startups, not really startups. I mean, some of them are quite advanced um, to create an umbrella organization, and the reason why. They got uh, interested to bring me on as a strategic advisor to the to the group. Um, is basically because of the AI capacity that I've developed here. Awesome. So the, I mean, for example, there is. Uh, let me show you the, the the meeting this Friday. I'm actually going to Cabo on Wednesday, so I'll be ten for ten days in Cabo, but uh, I can I can work from there. So they, these are all the CEOs of these companies who we're meeting with on Friday. Um, and uh, um, the idea is that we, we are creating this innovations brokerage. <clears throat> so for example, the president of the World Food Bank uh, you know, is willing to, to fund us with uh, operate with a startup operating capital. Um, so the 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 idea is to create um, an innovations brokerage that connects the farm to market supply chain, uh, where you negotiate between between potential customers, large customers like Walmart and and Kroger and uh, you know, maybe a, a catering organizations and so on, and farmers who need to create a, a differentiated type of crop in order to restore their soil, build their soil back. To health, so we 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 are um, uh, we would we would bring these groups together uh, to to set up what I call work streams, uh, and in each work stream you may have one that's focused on farmers, uh, farmers su support the, the group with technology like biofertilizers and things like that, um, uh, and so there's there's one group here the Agri Circle has developed a satellite based technology where they can uh, they can actually read the quality of soil via satellite it's just oh, cool. incredible um, and uh, and and give assessments to the farmer on uh, you know what what would be the most beneficial type of crop for him to grow um, the world food bank is one of the largest buyers in the world go ahead Plus, yeah the I've heard about satellites used being used to detect the spectrum of the crop that was growing and therefore understanding what's happening with the soil. Is that what you're referring to? Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, you can actually look at a, at a leaf, right, and see what the nutrient content is of it. And is it, is, is it distressed? Does it, does it have enough water, enough fertilizers and all of that, nutrients and all that stuff? So anyway, so that's that's where we're going and we're, we're like an inch. So we have had several uh, 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 potential funders now who have lined up and we're trying to raise $1.5 million in the startup um, and, and, uh, and, and bridge you know, the first year. So the interesting part is the climate chain has developed a blockchain technology that is uh, uh, multiple factors more efficient uh, and uses less energy than than what uh, uh, regular blockchain does. So this allows us uh, an efficient form of tracing. But so anyway, coming back to it, the 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 neo book approach to 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 programming or training the AI turns out to be the most efficient way to to go about it. I mean, I can get uh, I can get responses from the AI that I have been working with. With just like very uh, uh, easy questions, you know, without you know, a lot of of dialogue, and I get just an amazing response back, um, and and that happens really across uh, several fields. Um, so so I've developed you know, like five or six uh, chatbots now, each specialized in into in, into a different field, like you can see on my website. You know? Um, so Joni, who is the CEO uh, of this uh, com of the company, uh, she presented this in Denver at an investment conference uh, last week, and uh, she explained the chatbot that uh, assists 
uh, medical personnel in de in developing meal plans based on very specific types of disease. Um, where the chat where the the chatbot identifies the type of nutrients that are required for this person to 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 recover from pathology, right? So particularly like recovery from cancers and 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 diabetes and things like that. And her her feedback was that uh, the response was just overwhelmingly positive, with a lot of people saying they never thought of deploying AI in that fashion, right? And so when you when you uh, read the the uh, the uh, literature, I mean the AI related uh, uh, literature, um, that seems to be the way to go forward with AI. You know, is to train the subject matter specialists, you know, who are sort of narrowly defined uh, in 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 what they are focused on. Um, and the, then, and then the other thing is that you have to maintain a central control over those chatbots. So we, we are we are developing a user interface that links to my chatbot, because the thing is, as regulations change, and and as new uh, actors come into the market, and new technologies or inventions come into the market, you need to update that chatbot and point it towards these developments, right? And so if you have a thousand people using the same chatbot, uh, uh, they would get instantly updated information, right? Because in their conversations with that chatbot, uh, the, the, this this thing would be instantly uh, up to speed. Uh, whereas if you decentralize it, um, then people would theoretically have to do this on their own, which is not, never going to happen. So you need this centralization in training that chatbot. Uh, and then providing the the access to this center, which is amazingly good, but it's also amazingly scary, right? <laughs> because you could uh, you could use this uh, for nefarious reasons uh, and and uh, make a mess. Use your powers for good. That's it, you know. So so in other words, you have to deploy radical transparency in how this chatbot is programmed. And there's nothing better than to just publish the Neo book that has been used to train this thing, right? Because now everybody is, is clear on it. So I, I have opened up the Neo book on my website. So anybody interested in how does this chatbot uh, uh, get to uh, digest information and respond to it? Well, this is how it works. You know? this, is what, this is what it has been trained on. So, so in that sense, I think neobooks are just uh, are just uh, uh, an amazing way, you know. I mean, an amazing idea to use as a training tool. Uh, so I don't know how that fits into all the discussions that you're having now, but um, this is just a very you know, technical, uh, mechanical sort of uh, sort of thing to do. Um, one thing we talked about briefly on our previous call that might be relevant here is thinking of neobooks as a body of nuggets but if you were to draw a dotted line around a particular subset of nuggets that could be a corpus for a gpt right and so you're giving it the intelligence of these nuggets here and you want it to represent them and be intelligent about that collection of ideas or whatever it might be um and, and that feels to me like a easy, easy, conceptually simple way of thinking about the relationship between different kinds of agents and uh, the interactivity that they that they offer with knowledge, and the way that nuggets are cultivated or connected or you know whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, we had this exchange with where Gil was wondering whether the Torah uh, has been digested by. Uh, AI and and uh, and I, you know, so I, I picked a copy of of the Torah and and put it into this chatbot. Well, this sounded like an easy thing. You give this thing an article and something comes out. But that particular chatbot has been trained basically on uh, the Bible, uh, on um, uh, uh, the the letter to a Hindu by Tolstoy. 
the Stoics, you know, the Vada. So, so what I what I have put into this thing is ten thousand years of uh, human evolution. I mean, you will Harari's in there. So to understand the human animal, right? So to to understand the the what what drives our species and how do we think and how do we emote and how do we respond. So when this chatbot looks at you know, this particular document, uh, the Torah, it comes, it responds with that background, right? So you you can you can ask the same question on your chatbot, you would get something completely different. Um, and what it basically was saying is you know, the the uh, I, I can't respond to any religious work because they, they, it's emotional. It is not reality based. You know, it, it it's not. I mean, it's fictional, and so so it, it it has to put that aside. And and so this this quality of response uh, is is really is really remarkable. And and I think um, as the, the the application of AI becomes more common as a tool set, you know, it it will it will really uh, 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 you know, change the workplace. Cool. Other thoughts on this? Questions? Well, I'm just, what you said about the nuggets piece, and, and I think uh, Marc Antoine understands better than, than uh, any of us uh, what that looks like at, from a network perspective, um, based on what he, it sounds like he's been working on. And to me, a nugget by itself has very little value. A nugget and its relationships has extreme value. A nugget and its network has, you know, evolving network uh, value. It's the relationships that make nuggets really what as powerful as they can be. And so a nugget by itself, either in a book or as a message or an idea or a concept, it's great. But how do we relate it, connect it, and build that network of knowledge? That's what I think we're talking about here. Um, a, a connectome, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and so this building of a network um, of connections between ideas, between somehow, somewhat, somewise um, is, and, and now that we're sort of saying the how's, what's, why's, I, I more and more am getting excited about what this model of a nugget really can be. Because it starts to, to me to be very practical, not just conceptual, right? And, and the practical parts of you know, what, what uh, Klaus is talking about, uh, Klaus is talking about, there's some practical stuff of how to do food better, how to transfer food better, how to bring food to the market better, how to keep the soils uh, healthy. All of that's house, right? But there's a lot of whys and what's behind those house that are critical. Um, how do we relate those things is, I think, the key part of that. And how does that, you said you, you want to put a dotted line, Jerry, around? Mm -hmm. I think you're putting a lot a dotted line around some hows, some whats, some whys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a broad spectrum. Uh, it isn't just, um, and, and, and that's, I'm charting to figure out, to, to think, how did these what, was whys, and hows, how do they coexist in a broader world. Mm -hmm. Cool. And when I say dotted line, it's really just metaphoric. It's, it's, sure, a, sure. it's, a, play, it's a playlist. It's a subgroup. It's a subset. It's some It's some way of saying this cluster over here is what I want to direct your attention to. That's, that's all mm -hmm. it is. And that subcluster might have special purpose metadata, might be very customized to a particular purpose. Great. Sounds great. Let's go. Um, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, and here it's important to understand that that's where you are touching on the limitations of AI, because the 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 um, I mean, for example, remember when I wrote my first book, 
uh, I inserted uh, uh, spiral dynamics and I inserted theory U. Well, the AI would have never thought of connecting these things, right? So you have specific, you, you may come across, you may work on a topic where it becomes important to understand certain aspects of the food system. And then you can take one of my knuckles and then insert that into your into you in your book, you know, into what you are assembling there, because it just makes uh, uh, sense within the context of your conversation that you're developing here. So this is really how how nuggets in my mind become useful, because you you you're working, and you are the operator, you are the, the 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 brain of this conversation. It's not the AI, right? So the but the AI needs needs to 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 um, be stimulated with the connect with the systems perspective, right? And not and AI cannot think in systems. It's a linear thinking system, right? It doesn't branch out into into connections. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not so I'm not so sure about that because I think the internal representation of all the tokens in vector space, whatever, is incredibly multidimensional in ways we won't begin to understand for quite a while. It so happens that it has to, the way it communicates to us is it squeezes out a word at a time and composes something that looks really linear. But I think that what's going on is extremely nonlinear. If, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. The, I mean, to give you an example, I was just writing uh, a letter on glyphosate. And so as I'm as I'm stimulating the AI, you know, to to put together, uh, you know, a perspective on the health impact and what's known about the medical impacts of, of uh, uh, glyphosate, I then stimulated it by saying there are lawsuits that have been lost by Monsanto for Roundup, which is used in household applications, but it's also glyphosate, right? It did not come up on that on its own. You know, I had to tell it that there were lawsuits on Roundup. So, so the the and so you have examples like this uh, you know, in in a, in multiple areas where where my mind, you know, is 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 thinking in terms of systemic connections. Mm -hmm. now, once you once you ask that question, this AI takes off like woof, you know, and and goes into pip pulling. Uh, lawsuits and pulling articles and stuff, which I would have never thought of and, and, and never been able to to accomplish. But it is this initial systems thinking, you know, where you where you make connections that the AI doesn't come up with. Like I said in my neo book, you know, it would have not on its own pulled uh, spiral dynamics as a communications tool to add into this discussion. It would have not done that. So if you had not, if you had given it a prompt. Hey, you know, we've thank you. We've we've collaboratively written a thesis about regenerative agriculture. I'm looking for innovative ways to communicate this to people in very different constituencies. What models might I use to do that? Do you think it would not have come up with spiral dynamics as one of the possibilities? Well, it's a different way of stimulating it into systems. Yeah, yeah. but I'm saying I'm, I'm saying it, it's just it, the same it, thing. It, it might have known about spiral dynamics already. It clearly did because when you said, "Hey, use spiral dynamics to do this," it went boom, 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 right? So it, it had it in its corpus. It's just that it wasn't stimulated to produce it yet. Not produce it, connect it. Yeah. Right. So you have the same question that you just asked is creating a connection. It would have not thought of on its own. That was that's my point. And so if you instead of doing that can grab a nugget that someone else has developed or you have developed and then just say here use this conversation to add in you know a communications protocol then then uh, you have achieved the same thing cool anybody else with thoughts on this or maybe just to respond to what you're just saying i think i think it's it's speaking to the synergies that you can have between the two and the way you framed it jerry um, you know, I, my mind went off and said, well, it could have done this model. It could have done this model. It could have done Perry's theory of cognitive development, Kohlberg's theory of moral development. So you might actually have, you know, like 20 different frameworks that you can run it by and then decide, okay, of those frameworks, which ones are, you know, captures the best. I mean, 
Perry's framework of cognitive development is, is relatively simple and not as complicated as uh, spiral dynamics. So you can have different things. So uh, I, I just I just think the the you know the, the potential creativity between um, AI and human ingenuity is just you know how can we exponentiate? And this is maybe a segue into uh, what I wanted to maybe raise a little bit more. You know, when you were talking earlier, Jerry, about the way you're working, I was thinking, oh, that's interesting. Maybe we should have a protocol about the way in which Jerry's going about um, putting across his work on trust or whatever it might be through different platforms or whatever. What are the different other different ways of doing it? And in some respects, you're really talking about, well, how can you actually expand the influence of anybody's work? Because uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, you can have these network of ideas, but if it's not embedded in human networks, it ain't going anywhere. It's going to be a pretty thing on the shelf. And, oops, Daisy. I'll have to put that on hold just a second. Somebody's calling me. Sent it. Voicemail. Um, and so, um, and, and, and as a brief aside, I want to illustrate this uh, from the experience I just had yesterday. I think I've shared with the group that I occasionally go to the humanist meeting group through the U Church, which I don't attend anymore, but I go to the humans group. And yesterday, I was very pleasantly surprised by something. It's always nice to hear something you've never heard before, and you thought, woohoo. And what it was, was uh, this is a counterpoint to Liberty University, uh, which is uh, which actually trains military chaplains in uh, Christian nationalism to, to, to be in the in the forces so you can imagine that's not a very good uh, that's not a very good mix um, and the the organization that I learned about yesterday and the uh, the leader of the organization came to the church and her name oh, I can't remember it you know it'll come to me but anyway it's called Star King ministry you want to look that up I'd never heard of it before and it, it's a UU base but it's into dominational in terms of people coming into it and they have a variety of different programs but if you're if you're if you're a progressive uh, a, a spiritual progressive uh they've been working at this for a long time and i'd never heard of them before um and i thought oh that's interesting and the question i posed to her was you know i i said to her i, I said you know you got okay you've got your master's you've got your your, your bachelor's degrees you've got your certificate programs uh they've got a 10-week a program called We, which I thought was, you know, it's it's an intro thing, you know. Um, but I asked her, I says, do you have an uh, sort of like an uh, learning innovation hub? Um, and what I'm about to say, you know, put aside this the content, think of the ideas of it. Well, how can you actually uh, create uh, ongoing learning opportunities that are scalable for? anyone to participate as part of an intergenerational lifelong learning process where um, people can come and participate and be part of an ongoing learning community where uh, nuggets, I would, I would frame nuggets as questions uh, in, in terms of evoking inquiry in such a way that people can emancipate themselves from the mass indoctrination that we're all subject to, to and focus on emancipation opposed to influence. Now, interesting enough, the language she used was anti-oppression. And my and I didn't I didn't have that much time to chat with a with a woman, but you know, to me, the flip side of anti-oppression is emancipation. And I think there's very different ways of looking at that. And they come, you know, the, the, you know, they come with different uh, pros and cons. So I've become more interested in the notion of emancipation. Uh, enabling people to come become well how can you scale up emancipation in such a way that people can become open-minded um, uh, free thinking virtuous you know learners um, and how can we create those sort of learning environments where you have networks of beloved learning communities coming together and solving our wicked problems now uh, obviously what I just said is is a um, is a whirlwind of ideas. Um, but I think we have to start designing our learning systems that have that capability for uh, exponential change. So anyway, uh, I'll stop there and just just a whirlwind of ideas. But um, 
you know, I just think that the way in which we, even the way this university set itself up, if you flip the paradigm and say, look, let's go, let's try and create learning communities that uh, can engage together longitudinally over time um, and that are low cost, low entry, uh, because these top down programs don't scale well, except Liberty University has done a far better job than <laughs> uh, Star King Ministry has, because they know how to market their they know how to market their shit. Well, That's they, what also, they, know they also have do. they also have financial backers who want. Oh, their, uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, so yeah, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, how yeah. are you going to take on the dark side? What's her no, name? My, Gabriela my... Latini. Um, no. Um, okay. That's the, that's I, the current I, dean, so it wasn't her. No, no, it wasn't her. Anyway, so... Um, you know, th there's that... also an asymmetry in being able to market certainty versus uncertainty and introspection. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And the question is, how can you flip that paradigm that, I mean, in some respects, it feeds into cognitive development, spiral dynamics, yada, yada. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and and to me the 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 short very is, very is, relevant. Yes. Yeah. So the question then become: Well, if you're going to flip the ed learning pro, I don't. I, I'd like to get away from the you know the you know the notion of education, but a learning paradigm that actually instead of is designed for simplification, and it's not in any way designed to address uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, etc. And that's why we're not good. That's why we're far better in creating wicked problems, self-inflicted wicked problems, than preventing in the first place. Anyway, that's my rant. <laughs> Reactions. <laughs> Thoughts? No, no, I, I totally agree. The, 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 for me, the, um, it, it comes back to protocols in the sense that uh, what we've been trying to do with SenseCraft is to get people to co-construct sense-making artifacts Sensecraft extremely primitive. I'm really unhappy with it. But the point for me is there are patterns at all layers. Like we know about uh, cognitive biases as a set of patterns or syllogism as a pattern. So there are patterns about thought. That's one layer. It's, it's a very low layer. But above that, there are kind of metacognitive patterns. Why would I use this heuristic rather than that heuristic? And why is this criterion more appealing than that criterion? And this is really the upper level. And how do we negotiate uh, with one another as we try to align knowledge? Those are patterns. And there's patterns in the form of protocols. It's, it's not pattern, not static things, but dynamic. How do we negotiate? Uh, protocol is one, it's a heuristic for a pattern, right? I think that some heuristics may not quite take the protocol pattern. For me, protocol involves a, a, a set sequence. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's more fuzzy than that, but it doesn't matter. We have an open space of how do we negotiate at a higher level than finding certainty? How do we negotiate at the level of negotiating shared meaning? And this is something that we all need to train in. Uh, exactly. And explore and invent, because there is yeah. never going to be a fixed list of the right way to do this. There's going to be these lists of things that sometimes work well, sometimes work not so well, and case studies of when does that work well. And but but making this the object of study, I think, is really important collectively. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some respects, uh, to to put it in the pr protocol framework, is how do you how do you enable people to develop complexity, uh, have protocols to enable people to develop complexity skills to solve wicked problems? Yep. And once you it, once you adopt that frame, it's completely, you know, it, it just, it, it, it puts aside, it, it puts linear reductionism in, the, in its correct place in dealing with comp complicated problems. And we have to acknowledge the beauty of it, but it's very limited. And what it can achieve, and so we're still stuck in that old paradigm. Uh, that's the you know the predominant modus operandi of how people you know live in the world, and 
it's not heading us in the right direction. But if so, you look at it, how, how business uh, has handled this, I mean, the Walt Disney Company, for example, where I spent 10 years in, in the... Uh, uh, in the in the project team in, in in the Imagineering group, I mean they have a they have a project management protocol, right? Mm -hmm. And that project management protocol gets you through stages of development where you start with blue sky ideation, feasibility check, you know, then you go down the path, so you stay in a safe zone before you commit money or before you commit right into anything. And you overlay that with theory U, right? The the uh, stages of exploration. So now you have a project development protocol that's very powerful, you know, and can be applied to absolutely anything. Uh, and so you combine that with a communications protocol. You know, so this is how we communicate with the different groups, the engineering team, the architectural team, you know, the creative marketing team. And so, and so that's how that's how you get into uh, this kind of large scale project planning. Yeah. Um, fam but, Procter and Gamble, for example, famously has protocols for how you launch a new product or how you extend an old product or whatever else. And there's there's very you know there's stage gates. There they've thought about this for a long time. There's a rhythm to it. And people who who are alumni of PNG are famous because they they have this ingrained in their genes. Um, also, AWS is the, the the absolute product of uh, uh, what's his name, the founder of Amazon, basically Bezos. Bezos. Bezos, Bezos saying, hey, the only way you're going to request something from another department if you do it twice is if you declare an API and, and like like formalize it so that then anybody can do it. And then one day somebody had the bright idea, oh my God, we're doing this internally. Why don't we sell this externally? But because they had in, imposed that religion across the entire enterprise, they suddenly were able to externalize their services and make more money from that than from selling stuff. Although I'm not sure you know, profit yeah, margins but, are better or worse. Yeah, I, I, I'd like you to maybe um, play the devil's advocate uh, to both what you just said, uh, Jerry, and also to the Disney Imagineering frameworks about, okay, those are the upsides, but what are the downsides? Because mm -hmm. if it's just constrained within the framework of corporate neoliberalism, it's problematic. So go explain what is corporate neoliberalism in terms of project management. Oh, well, I'm, I'm other, yeah. go, go ahead. ahead. No, I, I, you know, I, I'm just saying if the, if the overarching influence of project management is coming from corporate neoliberalism, the outcomes are going to be very different than if they were based upon uh, Gaia and uh, equity meta governments, for example. So the, 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 I mean, the project, I mean, you live in the field, so I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, you, you can tell me more than, more than I can tell me more about the limitations that I can, but what are the limitations of that project management protocols that are embedded within a system because I'm not convinced they can be easily adapted to um, focusing on a degrowth uh, regenerative framework. Why not? I mean, you're going into a blue sky phase where you develop your targets, your objectives, you know, your your desired outcomes, and then you go into a feasibility check and see how could we possibly achieve this. You know, I mean, it has nothing to do with uh, a pre with fixed uh, neoliberal ideas. It's simply well, that's good. Well, that's good. I mean, if you can see how it can be uh, transplanted without any alteration to a different context, then that's the way it needs to go. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark, uh, Mark uh, Antoine, uh, Mark Antoine, yeah. and then me, and then me. <laughs> yeah, I have. See, I think what happens is this. This is very much management that is uh, planning. We decide we do this, we do this. So there's a centralized decision system. And that works for a well-defined unit, which has its own man uh, decision boundary, so to speak. The problem is a lot of these problems are emergent at a global level. And so there's no decision unit that applies at that level. 
uh, this is why it's hard to apply. I mean, during the dictatorship, uh, <laughs> uh, world dictatorship, the the levels are not the same. So we need to be able to think about negotiating not only goals but means between units. That's essential. And that's we don't want centralized goal decision. We need goal negotiation. So it's a very different process, I think. So that's when you are overlay it with theory U, right? I mean, one principles of theory U is that you design uh, up to like 50, 60% uh, before you get into prototyping and that you advance the design as you move along. But you have preset in, uh, in the crystallization phase your targeted and desired outcomes. Now, I, I mean, this is just totally philosophical, right? I mean, you can you can uh, uh, you you can create uh, uh, by a Monsanto uh, in this the same process that you create a regenerative farm to market supply chain system. You know, I mean, but uh, it's just it's just where theory you is still within group. It still happens within group. We need an intergroup process. Anyway, sorry, I, I want Jerry to. Uh, yeah, briefly. Um, so I, my way of addressing Rick's question about the neoliberal sort of protocols is, uh, Klaus, my understanding of your career path is that you worked at Disney, you worked at Cash and Carry, and then you were like, oh, my God, a lot of the stuff I've been doing for decades is actually harming the earth. If you so so I'm willing to bet that the protocols you went through that you just described at Imagineering at Disney um, did not include hey what species damage are we doing how is the current system actually hurting farmers and the earth and all that kind of stuff and if you had the benefit of hindsight from what you now know how would you modify yeah, exactly. the protocols that exist at Imagineering to compensate for that that's a really interesting question for me. So I wouldn't modify the core protocol, but I would add protocol to it. That's what I'm. That's a modification. So, so. so what you would do is you would uh, you would add a protocol called externalities. Yes. To mm -hmm. your right. decision making process, right? Which is which is the one thing missing from practically all corporate decision making. Exactly. And, but you you add that in now. You know, same process, same same uh, structure. Because you still have to do a feasibility check, you're still dealing with technology and technical issues, and you know, so so you need to sort through all of that. So you, you have an engineering issue that you need to deal with. I was an econ major in undergrad, and the thing that made me not go into economic theory another step. One of the things was when we dispensed with externalities in about 15 minutes in one lecture. And I was like, <laughs> that, my, 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 little, my little inner voice was like, that sounded important, Don. It's what, was that? what was that? <laughs> that, that? That thing, it just sounded important. How do we like just dismiss that? Yeah. It's just well, Jerry, I, yeah. Jerry, I have a, a question for you uh, and you, Klaus. Okay. Having identified exactly what you just said, what's in Jerry's brain? And what is in Klaus's brain that would advance the incorporation of the externalities into an imaginary process or whatever protocol you want to? What are the. We're losing your audio, Rick. You've moved away from your Wi Fi or something. Could you hear me now? Yes. Okay. We, no, we heard just... the first part of what you said, but not the last part. Okay. No, I was just saying. Uh, what could you do that? What, what are the best resources within Jerry's brain and Klaus's brain that incorporates these externalities that enables Imagineering or what other other protocol that you're describing? Where where is the best examples of people who are really uh, incorporating these externalities? Go ahead, Jose. Yeah, it's just. I think the externalities is a big piece. I don't think it's the only thing. Um, no, it's not. It, because part of those protocols in larger corporations are, they're designed to meet a certain goal and that the goals themselves are dysfunctional. So it's not just the externality, it's it's the, the starting point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and then once you change the starting point, then you actually have a whole different set of protocols 
because the protocols are designed to meet a certain goal, a certain set of needs. And then it ends up that those protocols don't actually work right anymore. Um, and, and so I think there's some technical protocols to what you're speaking, Klaus. You need to do an analysis. But what are you doing an analysis for? Is the analysis actually for uh, how profitable it will be, for how viable it will be functionally? Um, or is it for how life-serving it is? Right. It, yeah, well, it's going to cost more, but it's life serving. Right. Right. And, and so the, those things, I think, that's where we need to figure out. We as a society, we as humanity need to figure out how to blend those things because we need to know how to do the technical within the context of, of life serving. I, I don't, don't see it as blending, I see it as sequestering. Right? Because the, those considerations have to come before you enter the project stage. So you have to make, you have to, in the crystallization process, you have to define that we do not want to harm the environment. We do want to enrich whatever. We, so, so those kinds of, of, of thoughts have to, be, have to be defined before you go into blue sky development and feasibility, which is strictly an engineering process at that point. I want this conversation to have a natural end, but I need to uh, bounce. So I'm going to pass the con to Mark Antoine. Is that okay? No, I, I, yeah, I, I, I need to go as well. Oh, why don't we end the end the meeting then right now? And I thank you all. We can pick up uh, next week, possibly at our new time. I will inform everybody uh, when it happens. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, everybody. Bye.